Howdy everybody, David Macon here, starting player with Connect More, and welcome to a special Kickstarter preview edition of Avoid the Rules, a video of instruction and demonstration that helps ease rule understanding and learning. Easy start, and today I'm featuring a deck building game called Web of Spies. Now you'll notice I talk about a deck building game, but I'm showing a map right here at the beginning of the game. Well, the map is what provides for some interesting and unique gameplay experiences throughout this game, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Because after all, the whole point of doing a Kickstarter preview video is not to only talk about the rules themselves, but to give you enough information and to dwell on some of the points which I think are important that will help you decide whether or not this will be a welcome addition to your game collection. Now, there's a lot of places you can actually spend your Kickstarter dollar these days, so hopefully this review will be informative for you. And if not, if you have any lingering questions, please leave a comment or questions below and I'll try to answer them the best that I can. Now, again, being a Kickstarter preview video, these components are not the final components. I've cannibalized Snowdonia for some of the cubes. Um, I've printed off the board. I'm not even sure if this is the size that it's going to be. And all of the cards that I'm showing are actually your old versions of the print and play. So take that in mind, but the gameplay and mechanics itself should have remained constant from the time of this video to the actual time that the Kickstarter launches. So without further ado, why don't we jump into the game? Now, Web of Spies is a deck building game for two to four players, and it provides a fairly unique experience for both two, three, and four players. And I'm going to talk about that later on in the video. If you're familiar with the mechanics of Dominion or other deck building games, the actual hand management mechanics of this game are identical. Each player is going to start with 10 cards in their hand, and they're all going to be the identical 10 cards. Now these cards, as you can imagine, are not as powerful as the rest of the cards in the deck that you're going to be trying to acquire throughout the game, such that your hand may become more and more powerful. Now the way to think of your deck is this is in fact your spy agency. This is what it represents. This represents all of your spies, all of your sweet vehicles, all of your ammunition and guns and different weapons that you might have, and you're going to start off with a fairly weak spy agency. You're going to basically have some no name guys, like they're not, definitely don't have Jason Bourne in here. And you're going to start off with a black car. Well, every spy agency needs a black car, a secret identity, and um, a silenced pistol. And the rest are just, you know, no name guys uh, trying to be the next Jason Bourne. But if you think of this as your spy agency, and on your turn, you're going to take from your draw deck five cards. So you, once you have your five cards, and then you're going to get your spies and your weapons and your vehicles to actually do things for you. And what you're going to be trying to do is to improve your position by actually attacking other people. Because attack and battles is a big part of this game since the game ending condition occurs once somebody has been eliminated. And we'll talk about that. But the cool thing to think about then, if you refer to your hand as your spy agency, is that you can think of all of these cards here as assets or things that your spy agency would like to acquire. And at any one time, there's going to be three assets available for you on your turn. Two of these assets are known to you and they're face up, and another asset is unknown. You're not really sure what it is, but there's always that cloud of mystery around that spy world, so you can expect that. Now these assets, actually, they represented here with a token, and again, I don't know what that's going to look like in the final game, but this token is also out on the board here. So for example, this asset right here is located in Moscow right now. So in order for you to be able to add that into your hand, you actually need to move one of your spies, which is represented here by these cubes, and each player is going to start with five spies on the board. You actually need to move one of your spies and have a rendezvous with this asset in Moscow. And should you meet all the conditions required for you actually to get this card, well, then you would take this asset and you actually put it into your discard pile. So it does not go immediately into your hand. It goes into your discard pile like you can imagine with other deck building games. At the end of the turn, you take whatever cards you have left in your hand, put it all in your discard pile, and again, you draw five new cards from your draw deck. Once you go through all this process again and your draw deck is empty, you shuffle up uh, your discard pile with all the cards that you've played, plus the new cards that you may have acquired or the assets that you may have acquired, and now you actually have a stronger spy agency as you go through it again and again and again and the idea here is to build up your spy agency and to maneuver on the board in such a way that you might emerge victorious. So that's a brief overview of the game so let's jump in and take a closer look at the board because 
As you can see with the actual hand management side of things, it is the same as several other deck builders. But on the board is where there's going to be some unique things and some interesting things that may set this game apart for you as to whether or not this might be a decision for you to add to your Kickstarter collection. And real quick, before we get started, I just wanted to jump in one more time to remind you that this game is going to start its Kickstarter around mid-October 2014. So if anything about this video has sparked an interest or something about it that you want to learn more more about, I highly encourage you to go to the Kickstarter page and to learn more and support this project if it's something that speaks to you. Thanks. This is Web of Spies. It's a card drafting game and you might notice, like, well wait a second, if it's a card drafting game, why don't you show me some cards? Well we'll get to that. The reason why I'm showing you the board that this game is played on is because the interaction that occurs in this game and also the victory conditions of this game are determined by your actions taken on the board. So first I wanted to take some time to show you what happens on the board and then we'll get into the cards a little bit later. So like I said, this is set up for a four player game and each of the players at the beginning of the game will put out one cube at a time in turn order round and round and go until they put out five cubes. Now these cubes represent your spies and hideouts and any other kind of unruly locations or people that you may have as a part of your general web of spies or as your spy agency. And the whole point of this game is to be able to eliminate one of the other players and completely eliminate all of their spies off the map. As soon as that occurs, the game will end end immediately provided that there is still one spy agency who has a clear majority of spies left on the map. If there are still two or more spy agencies that are tied for number of spies left on the map, then the game will go into sudden death and the game will continue to be played until finally at one moment in time there's only one spy agency with the majority of cubes still left on the map. That person will be declared the winner. So have no fear, there is player elimination in this game, but as soon as that occurs you go straight to sudden death and it may be that there might not be sudden death, there might be somebody with the clear majority already when that first person is eliminated and woohoo, you are the winner, you are the master spy agency. So, how does that all occur? Well, first of all, before we get into all of that, I want to show you the differences in gameplay that you might experience also between the different number of players. And the reason why I'm going to show you this is I found in my experience that whether it be a four player, three player, or two player game, there are different styles and different feelings to the game. And I'm just going to show you the setup very quickly for three and two players as well, so you might get a feeling and so I can show you visually what that looks like. So. Let me show you that and then we'll get back to how the rest of the game is played. And this is what the game looks like at the beginning of a three player game. Here we have pink, yellow and blue. Each of them have five spies out on the board which they placed out there as before in the four player game. And you'll notice unlike the four player game there are a few more empty spots throughout the board yet you're still in close proximity of your opponents. So this is actually a very nice setup for three players because there will be turns where you don't have anything in your hand, where it's kind of a garbage hand and you're not very strong, you're not very powerful to go on the attack. So with three players, you still have the ability to hopefully kind of run and hide or maybe have attention directed towards somebody else so that on those turns where you don't have such a powerful hand that maybe you can lay low. But that's not always guaranteed because since you are always within close proximity of another player, they may be the ones that are going to be picking on you. So that also introduces a bit of metagame is trying to get the other two players playing against each other. And that's where this game begins to shine, is when you're playing with a group of players who really immerse themselves into the spy experience and try to embellish the experience a little bit more above the table with their discussions amongst each other. So this is what a three player game looks like. So let's get back to the four player example. I wanted to show the three player setup before I got into the mechanics of the games because it makes a difference as to how the game is going to feel. Because with a two player game versus a four player game, there's a difference in space available between you and your opponents. In a four player game, you see that everyone is pretty much on top of each other and there's always going to be the possibility of an interaction amongst either you and this opponent or the ones uh, next to you. There's always going to be something going on. Whereas in a two player example with more space, there's more of that possibility for that cat and mouse style of game. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because you know the number of players you may typically play with in your game group and then you can 
evaluate that as I go through the rest of the mechanics of the game. So let's continue. As I mentioned before, the way you're going to win this game is by being the most robust spy agency, which is basically represented by the fact that you're going to have the majority of spy cubes left on the board the moment that the someone gets eliminated or immediately thereafter should you emerge as having the majority of cubes and the game ends immediately and you win. So with that in mind, it's quite obvious that there has to be player interaction, and I've already told you this is a card drafting game, so let's talk about the cards and how in fact you're going to build your deck and how you're going to get these cards. You'll notice here on the bottom part of the board there are three spaces available where cards are going to be placed that we are going to be able to acquire and add into our own hand of cards and thus make ourselves more powerful and a more efficient spy agency. Now these cards are going to come from this big deck of cards that come within the game. There's a whole bunch of them here and uh, the one thing I want to point out is the cards that I'm using here are print and play cards that I've printed off just specially for the uh, Kickstarter preview video here. These do not represent the final artwork of the cards. Just to give you a flavor as to what the next iteration of the cards look like, they look something like this with kind of a cool black and white uh, kind of spy artwork to them. I'm not sure if this is even going to be the final artwork, but the thing I want to stress is, is that the cards I'm using have the same symbols that it looks like they're going to continue using in throughout the game and the same text and the distribution of cards is the same. So keep that in mind, even though I'm using uh, cards that look um, not so sexy they it's still very much it's exactly the same game so the way that this works is you'll take the top card off the deck and I'm going to explain all of these symbols here in a brief moment but first I'm going to show you how you're going to get these cards so you take this card off the top deck and you put it right here where it says public asset now you'll notice that I got two dice here I got a dark colored dice and I got a light colored dice and if you look on the board here you'll see that the board is divided into six regions and each region is actually denoted by a white or a light colored dice you got one two three four five six and within these regions you see that we have a number of cities and some of the cities don't actually have any number associated with them but there are one through six cities in each of these regions that are denoted by the dark or the black colored dice. So what you simply do is you roll these two dice together and you get a number. So here I got two, two. So first of all, I go to region two, which here is South America. And then I go to the dark dice and find out what city it is. So here we're in Caracas. So I take the next um, token that I have, which matches the token here on, um, on my card, and I put that token there. So this basically represents, this is a part of your agency or uh, it might be a character, it might be a vehicle, there's a whole bunch of different things that it is. And in order for you to be able to go acquire this card, you need to move one of your spies, one of your cubes on the board to that location so that you might have the ability to have a rendezvous and to uh, meet that guy and acquire them into your agency. And, if, and mechanically speaking, what that means is you will actually take this card and add it into your discard pile in your hand. And that that's how you're going to build your hand. So there's this geographical component to being able to add cards into your hand. And I really think that's a cool mechanic. Um, I'll talk about it in a little bit later, but I really like the fact that there's this geographical mechanism in which you need to go and actually acquire your cards. It's not like a lot of other standard deck building um, games where you actually just have a whole stack of cards out in the middle and everyone has um, equal access to those cards. No, here you need to kind of go out of your way and hunt down these cards and and then acquire them and to me that feels like a, a, a spy thing to do you gotta go have a rendezvous and get past Interpol and, and go there and meet up with these guys and, and get them to join your agency so I think that's pretty cool so just as we did here with the public asset number one we have another public asset number two it's exactly the same mechanic I rolled the dice so I should have flipped this over and so this goes down here it's a private jet and here we're in 6-6 six, six. Uh, so I take uh, the token that matches this token here and I go down to 6-6 six, six. there's already a guy here but that's not a problem you just put him underneath there and uh, that's actually going to work out quite well for the green so we leave him there so no problem at all now we go to the last uh, spot and here it says secret asset so this is a card where you actually don't take um, the card here and these cards are all referred to as assets assets of your spy agency you don't flip it over you keep it like this and you put it face down in that spot and again we denote this uh, with this token here and then what I do is I just roll the dice and we got one and five so we go up to North America and we see we're here in Washington DC so he goes right there so this guy is secret 
So how do you acquire these assets? Well, it's really quite simple. The first thing you need to be able to do is you need to have one of your cubes in the same city as where these assets are located. So you can see, for example, this particular um, green player, he's sitting in good position. He doesn't have to travel at all to get to Sydney to get at this public asset number two if it's something he wants. But generally what you would do is on your turn, you would move one of your spies to that same location as that asset, and then you would pay the cost of that asset. And the way you figure out the cost is you look at the asset here and you see that the cost is up here in the upper right hand corner of the card. So in order to acquire this asset into your hand or actually into your discard pile you would have to discard an additional three cards and it doesn't matter what cards because all of the discarding happens face down. You discard three more cards and then you get to add this card into your hand. So the cost of acquiring this asset is just listed right up here. The astute observer must be asking now well what about the secret asset? He's not flipped over so how do you know how much he costs? Well the secret asset always costs two cards that you take from your hand and you put in your discard pile and you get the privilege of taking the secret asset as well. Now the cool thing about that is there's not very many cards that only cost one card so generally the secret asset is a pretty good deal so he's very powerful to get. Now the thing I should mention is once you actually acquire one of these cards so say for example Green had taken that blue card and he takes this card here and he adds it to his hand then what you do is you remove that asset and you just put it back here until the Green's turn is over and then at the end of his turn then you'd replace replenish all of the cards as, as I did at the beginning of the game. You roll, you get the card, and then you just put it in the position. So here, for example, we go to four, city five. So there's four, and then five would be here in Moscow. So woohoo, pink is up next. Now, this is one thing I want to point out is the placement of the cards that are going to be available for you to draft into your hand is completely luck driven. It is totally driven by the roll of the dice and it's always changing. So this is another thing that I feel is worth discussing because for me this has a big impact on whether or not this game will be a game for you or not a game for you. Because if you like a game where you're planning and you want to kind of narrow in on somebody and kind of corner them, then this might not work for you. Because what's going to happen, especially in a multiplayer game when you have four or three players playing, is if you're trying to work in and trying to say acquire the blue asset, because he might be very powerful, and you don't have anybody in the area, you might be trying to work and get somebody over into that area, but by the time everyone's moved around, someone's actually already came and acquired that asset, and now the assets can been completely randomly redistributed somewhere else on the board. So it may have been here and now it might be redistributed down here to Melbourne because you might have rolled a six and a five. And then you'd be like, oh, like it, that might get really frustrating for you. And so then you go, okay, well, uh, maybe I like this gray card here. So you start going for that gray card and then somebody else snipes it out from underneath you. So there are strategies to mitigate this. Sometimes I find what you can do is if, especially if you get something close, you can go and camp on it, even if you don't have enough cards that actually pay for it, you can camp on it and that's going to prevent somebody else just from coming in and swooping it up from you. Because the thing I haven't mentioned is in order for you to actually acquire this asset, it has to be uncontested or you have to have the majority. So say for example, Blue decides to come over here and get the black asset. He comes, you see that within Washington DC, both Blue and Yellow are tied for majority. So neither one of them can actually get the card until they actually choose to battle each other. And the battles are where you can eliminate the other players and work your way towards the end game condition. And I'm going to talk about the battles here in a brief moment. But before we talk about the battles, I want to finish this discussion about how these cards are distributed on the board because it is random. And this is the only way you're going to be able to add cards to your own hand. So you may feel that at times this game is driving itself because with this luck based distribution of cards that goes on, you may end up just picking up whatever one of these cards is closest to you as opposed to trying to go out of your way and get one of these cards because you go well even though that's a very powerful card and I want it in my hand, it's just too far. Someone else is going to snipe it away from me. And that is also a difference between the four player and the two player game. Because in a two player game, I find there's more space. So sometimes this asset is as equally far away from your opponent as, as it is from you. Whereas in a four player game, since the board tends to be more crowded, there always tends to be somebody immediately adjacent, if not on 
that asset, especially at the beginning of the game before some of these cubes get eliminated or the spies get killed. I don't want to belabor the point, but it's a point for me that is very important to make because the way in which these cards are distributed add an extra layer of luck to the game. And some people might see that as a way of keeping the game light in terms of game weight. And that's great. If that's the experience you're looking for, well then this is a neat way of distributing the cards. Personally, I prefer a game where it would be my own strategy, whether it be through my card and my deck building or whether it be my maneuvering on the game board itself. I prefer a game where my own strategy is going to dictate whether or not I have a good or better outcome of getting any one of these cards than my opponents. But instead I found that sometimes the game felt like it was playing itself because if this asset was placed next to or adjacent to you or right on top of you, it was typically the card that you would go for because if even though you didn't like that card as much as the next card, that next card was way the heck away and you didn't have any assets there or any spies there to get at it, well then it didn't really serve you any benefit to go for that the card that was a far ways away because chances are someone else would get there before you anyhow and then in the meantime somebody would have taken this card that you're right next to and then you're still at the mercy of like well what's the next card coming up it may or may not be better it may or may not be what you're looking for so in that regard i think it's very important point to talk about and it might be a decision point for you one way or the other the last thing i'll say about the actual asset placement out on the board is that none of the assets can actually be placed on top of each other. So for example, the black asset and the blue asset could not be placed in the same city if you rolled the same numbers. If that happens, you just re-roll and then place that asset that you're placing in whatever the re-rolled city is. So that's quite simple. So there we've talked about the card distribution and how you're actually going to get them. But now let's talk about the situation here, which I was pointing out, these battles and how are we going to eliminate each other and how are we going to smack each other down and win the game. The important parts of the card when it comes to battles are these symbols up here you need to either have an attack symbol to attack or defend symbol to defend and these three symbols right here and these three symbols are what you're going to be matching against each other both the attacker followed by the defender then the attacker and back and forth it goes in a very seesaw type manner to decide who's going to win the battle now the advantage of the battle goes to the attacker because the attacker has nothing to lose he is trying to make the defender lose one of his cubes and of course drive towards that game ending condition and force the other player off the board whereas the defender is just trying to hang in there. Now there's a really cool mechanism to this battle which I'm going to show as to why this battle in introduces a really neat narrative and a neat time in the game for you to really get immersed into the theme and I'll show you what that's about. So let's go to this example here where we've got blue versus pink and we're going to say that it's blue's turn, he's the active player and this is his current hand so he's going to decide to attack the pink because he wants to get at that secret asset down here in Washington DC. So he takes a look at his cards and first of all he's going to notice of his five cards two of them are not at all available to him to use as an attacker because you notice that there's these symbols and none of them of which are the attack symbol, which are these three cards. So these are the three cards that he actually has available to him to use. So he takes a look and he's like, well, maybe I'll start off a little bit slow. I'm going to start with this Uzi because the defender will have to match one of these two symbols that's highlighted. So he's going to have to match my intel or perhaps my brute strength. So then he says, right, I'm going to declare battle on you, pink, and I'm going to start shooting you up with my Uzi. So now the defender, the pink player, he takes a look at his cards. And what he has to do in order to defend the the attacker, he has to match at least one of these two symbols that's highlighted on the card. So he takes a look at his hand and he's like, oh man, I was hoping to hang a little bit low this turn because you see that three of his cards are not at all available to him to use as a defender because they don't actually have the shield symbol on them. So let's just put those aside. So he has these two cards to choose from. So he takes a look at these two cards and he sees one has only the gun symbol on it and the other one has both the binoculars and the gun symbol on it. So he's taking a look and he knows he he knows he has a weak hand, but this is the neat thing about the battles, the really cool thing about this mechanic is whatever card the defender plays, then the onus is back on the attacker to match the symbols of the defender. The attacker does not get to start fresh. The attacker has to then respond to whatever the defender throws his way. So here the defender says, well, listen, you're going to throw some brute strength and some intel. You know, you got some intel on me and some brute strength. What can I do? So the defender says, hey, I can be shrewd about this. I I'm going to attack back chist with or defend with chist this one symbol and perhaps catch the attacker off guard and give myself till the next turn to kind of build up some strength and get my hand going again. So the attacker says I'm going to use my silence pistol back on you because the gun matches the gun. 
So then we go back to the attacker. So now the attacker must play a card that matches the symbol that the defender just played, which is here, the gun. So the attacker takes a look and he goes, ooh, of these two cards that I still have available to attack, I actually only have one that can defend against that or can attack again against that, and it's this one. So the attacker has to ask himself, do I want to keep pursuing this battle? I could withdraw right now and no harm would be lost. We both just lose a card and you don't actually lose that card. It would just go back to your discard pile until your next turn or until you shuffle the discard pile again. So the attacker says, no, I'm going to go after him again. I'm going to play this card. So then the attacker says, I now am playing this card here. And you see here, the attackers played a card that matches the symbol, which was previously played by the defender. So now it goes back to the defender. And the cool thing about this mechanism is this is where you can really get immersed into the actual theme and the story of the game, because you can start narrating like, well, you know, I'm coming at you. I've, I've done some studying on you. I've got some intel. I know you're in the bar. I, I did a pop shot at you from across the bar. And then, you know, the defender can say, oh, I saw you coming. So I was able to duck and shoot back. And then you say, and then you can, you can kind of get in this melee, you know, of, uh, of different, the storytelling, whatever you want to talk about, then you say, well, I see, and now you're basically in a crossfire, maybe uh, an open bar, people are running away as the spies are, are you know, um, start trying to take each other out. So it's a really cool mechanism, this, uh, this back and forth that goes. But anyhow, we go back to the defender, and again, now the defender has four cards left, and he, again, he only has this one card that's actually available to, to him to defend. So he takes a look, and he is in luck, because he sees that his defense card actually has these two symbols here. And this gun symbol matches the previously played gun symbol of the attacker. So he's obliged to play that if he, again, if he chooses he wants to, or he could just walk away, but then he would lose his cube. So he plays this, and he hopes that that's enough to ward off the defender. So again, this gun matched that gun, gun there. So we go back to the defender and he looks, he's only got one card left, but he's in luck. He actually has a surveillance symbol here highlighted. That's the only one he has highlighted. And he checks the card that was just played against him. The defender played a card that had both the gun and the surveillance. So if the attacker plays this, he'll match the surveillance there. So that would be allowed. So the attacker goes, right, I'm still attacking you. I've got some extra surveillance. So basically now, you know, the gunfight has ended. You've, you've gone gone away, you've licked your wounds in your hideouts, but now the attacker is starting to, to get some surveillance on your new hideout and he sees where you're at and he's coming at you again. So again, that's this back and forth um, battle that occurs. You can really create a neat narrative and it's a lot of fun when you're playing it with the right group. And so then you look at the defender and he's like, ah. Oh. I can't do anything to defend against this. And he's not obliged to prove this at all to the attacker. He can just say, okay, you know, that's it. You win the battle. So what would happen there is then the defender takes his two cards and he'll put them in his discard pile. Then the attacker takes his three cards and puts them into his discard pile. And then for his efforts, the pink has been defeated in Washington, D.C. And this cube, this spy is now out of the game. The blue was able to outwit him. And uh, in a whole shoot -em up scene and surveillance that went on afterwards in Washington, in DC and now he's won the battle and this goes out of the game. Now it is still Blue's turn, but he only has two cards left available in his hand because he used the other three in the battle. But he's sitting on top of the black asset, and lucky for him, that's the secret asset right here. So he says, you know what? I am going to acquire the secret asset because a secret asset, as you recall, only costs two cards. It can be any cards in your hands because you can discard these face down. So he takes these two cards, adds them to his discard pile, takes the secret asset, he adds that to his um, discard pile, and then this comes back through here. A new card is put on the secret asset, you re-roll the dice, and now the secret asset has moved to 2, 6. So now pink is on top of the secret asset. And it's the blue's turn is over because he has no cards left in his hand. Now the poor yellow player, he's played two of his cards in defense of himself, so at the beginning of his turn, provided he's not attacked again before his turn comes around, he will only be starting his turn with three cards. So he's been severely penalized uh, just for trying to defend himself. So that's one reason why perhaps depending on what your position is, you may want to kind of hold on to your cards, especially if you're planning an attack and you need some cards, especially if you have some of those cards with both the dual attack and defend um, uh, symbols on them. Uh, he is severely limited right now, and especially in a big player game, you can see someone get teamed up 
back to back because if they do a really great job defending themselves against one opponent, then the next guy might see him as easy picking to go and attack the next time. So that's another thing that you might find a little bit frustrating with a larger game experience is that people might start picking on you, especially if you see, you know, that you're you're limp, you're wounded, you're you're limping around. So that's one thing also to keep in mind because you do not actually refill your hand until the end of your turn. So if you're defending yourself outside of your turn, well too bad. During your turn you're going to have whatever was left at the end. In addition to battles and acquiring these asset cards, the cards in your hand are also required to be able to move your spies around the board. So every time you move your spy from one space to the next that's connected by this dashed line, what you simply do is you just take a card from your hand, so this is your card, your hand here, you just simply take a card from your hand and you place it face down on your discard pile. It's going to cost you one card per position move. So for example, you move from here all the way to there. You've moved two positions. You can take any two cards in your hand and just discard them face down so people don't see them. And that is quite simply the way that you move in the game. Now there are cards throughout the game that are called vehicle cards on them and they give you special privileges or abilities to move at a more efficient rate. So here for example, this can move the agent up to two spaces. So in this particular example, instead of playing the card face down and moving only one space, you would actually play it face up and read the special ability of the card so everybody could see it and then you could just directly move their two spaces and then only discard this one particular card leaving extra cards in your hand for other things you might want to do. So to quickly recap, the three things you can actually use your cards in your hand for are to acquire any one of these public or secret assets by paying the cost either listed here in the public assets or two cards for the secret asset and these costs are paid with your cards from your hand face down so nobody actually sees the cards that you're using. Your cards are also used for battles and doing the battles you're actually going to focus on the actual symbols of the cards whether or not it's the appropriate card to attack or defend with and if you have the appropriate symbols to match up the opponent you're battling with. And the third thing that you can do is actually move your spies around by discarding one card again face down from your hand into your discard pile to be able to move from one space to the next along the dashed lines. And this brings together an important discussion about this junk card, if you will, or your waste card that is given to you at the beginning of the game. In fact, you have seven of these kind of junk cards given to you at the beginning of the game. Now the thing about this junk card that is a little bit different than other deck builders is it's not completely a waste. And the reason for that is he can help you move and he can also help you acquire these assets because again, these cards are played face down and nobody will ever know if you play this card or not. So there is still some value to actually actually having this card in your hand. So this card, although it might help you build up your deck a little bit, is not going to help you with what is truly important with this game, and that's player elimination, that's spy elimination, that's the actual attacking part of the game. Now, the deck itself does not have a lot of cards that actually help you weed cards out. So you're effectively going to be stuck with most of these cards throughout the course of the game. There are a few different little cards in there that allow you to give cards to other players or to be able to kind of weed out a few cards or trash um, some cards, but there's no not many. So the way that you become more powerful in the battles is not so much by making your deck more efficient, but it's by making your deck bigger with these types of cards so that these essentially get watered out or watered throughout your deck because you're always going to have some of these. And that's actually a really important thing to keep in mind when you are battling because it introduces a bit of a press your luck type component. Because if you notice someone starting to fall behind in actually acquiring some of these assets and their deck's not as thick, because remember it's very difficult to be thinning out your deck and you can keep track of whether they are or not throughout this game, then you might start banking on the fact that they might actually have a few more of these and it might help you focus on who you're actually going to target throughout the game. So although these cards are not completely useless, like you might think of some other kind of junk cards in other deck building games, they certainly do not help you with what's important and those are the battles. Well, thank you very much for watching. I'm really glad that you took the time to watch this video and to see if whether or not Web of Spies is a game that's appropriate for you. I tried to include a lot of my thoughts throughout the course of the video, but why don't we just try to sum them up very quickly here at the end. And again, if you like this format of video, please come find me on Facebook or YouTube, Connect More Board Games. I'd love to see you there, and I'd love to see you in the next video that I do. 
So let's go and talk about the game. So first of all, if you're a fan of the Dominion style deck building that uh, mechanism, well, nothing has changed there. They, it's exactly the same here. But what's unique about this game is you actually have the uh, the map based component of it, and that that in itself is not unique because there's a lot of other um, deck builders out there. For example, I'm thinking of Few Acres of Snow. But uh, what I like about it, which I find is quite innovative, is that you have um, your different assets. You're trying to add these assets, these cards, into your hand, and they're running around the world. It's almost like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? They're, they're running around, and you need to move your spies and rendezvous with them. So for the first time that I played Dominion, I just didn't feel like I was actually in any kind of world. I didn't feel like I was trying to do anything. I was just adding cards and flushing cards and shuffling my deck, and, and I just didn't feel integrated into anything. And I find that this step actually... I feel more integrated it because maybe I just like the theme more. I like I do like the spy theme, but I find that this mechanism of trying to add cards into your hand um, help me feel more integrated into the theme because sometimes with deck builders I have a hard time feeling integrated in the theme. I like I like these tangible bits that I can move around and I can kind of make up a story. You know, here's we're down in Buenos Aires and uh, you know uh, my guy's coming down. It's a hot sweaty day and uh, you know I'm taking a truck loaded with chickens. You know, like whatever it might be, right? And you, you can you can story tell this game a little bit better than say some other deck builders that I have played. And again, I'm referring to Dominion. But although I really like that component of this game, sometimes I found this component extremely frustrating for me. And the reason being is you'd see some cards that were very powerful to you, but sometimes if they're a very powerful card, they're also a very expensive card. So for example, this one here, the Private Jet, is quite a powerful card you can use in combat, uh, you can defend yourself, it's got all the symbols, but it costs five cards. Five whole cards, that's your entire hand to buy this card. So then you sit there and go, well shoot, I really want this jet, but it's way over in Santiago somewhere, and I, I got my guys over here, and there's no possible way I'm going to get that card, not before somebody else gets it, especially in the early phases of a four or three player game. Near the end of maybe a two player game, you might be able to get to it, but then you're spending a lot of time just trying to get there. So for me, I found then if you got into that situation, like, well, okay, well, what else is there? What's close? And when I got into that position, then I found that the game was playing me and not the other way around. So for me, I found that part was a little bit frustrating because then it boiled down to wherever my guy was and wherever we rolled the dice to move these guys because you can't really set up like a, a web. You can't really set up a way to corner these assets to be able to add them into your hand. They, uh, they just randomly jump you know, back and forth to wherever they want because you're controlling them with the dice. So it's hard to manage or to work out some kind of strategies how you're actually going to get onto that card. Now, once the board starts thinning out a little bit, well, then it starts for me, getting a little bit more interesting because everybody is often equally far away. So then it invokes new strategies of, well, maybe I can just get my guy there and camp out on there, but then somebody else sees you like, well, if he's camping, I'm going to go camp too and I'm not going to let him take it. And then so instead of being able to just pick it up, well, now you have a contested location and now it's time for a battle. And so that brings me back to something that I really like about the game. I like the battles. I like the fighting. I like the forced interaction because after all, somebody must get eliminated from this game for it to end. So you're always going to be attacking each other. And I find that's what lacks in, say, for example, a game like Dominion because I there, okay, there are cards there that you can attack and blah, blah, blah. But I find sometimes in some other deck builders, and again, I keep referring back to Dominion, is that when it gets to somebody's turn, you just see them laying out all these combos, and you're, you're basically seeing how well that they can play solitaire, and you're just kind of waiting for your turn to see what, what you can do. Whereas here, on somebody else's turn, there's usually a lot of this going on, and so it keeps me more engaged um, throughout the course of the game, which is a plus. On the negative side, we talk about comboing cards, is... I didn't find in this deck there was a lot of combos, so I found that whatever you kind of got in your hand, it was very difficult to be able to start drawing from, from your draw pile with other combos and trying to work cards. It was very difficult to get any of those kind of synergies going. It was just sort of whatever you got, well those were your five cards available to you, 
do the best that you can. And there's some light combos that you could do, and there's but there just wasn't as much as you might expect from some other um, deck builders. So in that regard, um, I don't view that as a bad thing because I found then it just made my turns um, quite simple. Like I didn't have a lot to, to process, a lot to go through. You'd see your new hand, you go, okay, right, what am I going to do now? I've got five cards to choose from, maybe six. Uh, what should I do? So because of that, then I found that this game was very light. It became a very light uh, deck building game for me because I didn't have to really worry about big power combos or stringing out big things or how, I'm, how I was going to get these cards into my hands so that hopefully uh, I could shuffle them in and get some good draws that I can pull them in and work on the efficiency of my, my deck. Because I found here the other thing, there's not a lot of... Um, actually thinning cards. There's only a few cards um, here that will actually allow you to get rid of cards or to be able to trash cards. There are a lot of cards here that allow you to trash cards, but those typically tend to be your more powerful cards when you trash the cards. They're not the, the junk that you start at the beginning of the game with. So because of that, I found that in as the game goes on, you're not so much building your efficiency as you're just basically building your ability to do things. You're adding more powerful cards, but you still have all of that other um, junk that you started the game with in your deck somewhere. So your efficiency is being built not because you're weeding cards out, but just because you're starting to dilute those cards in your deck with more powerful cards. So if you like the, if you like playing the type of cards where you really like to um, streamline your your actual hand itself, well then you're going to have a difficult time with this game because there's not a lot of opportunities for you to continue to actually streamline your game. So. But then some people that, that works out great for them because then they know they're just trying to acquire these other cards. And again, because of that, I find that the game, I rank it in, a, in terms of weight, I just rank it lighter. So if that's the type of experience you're going for, it's a very light deck building game that forces um, player interaction amongst each other. And before I um, forget, I should mention the player interaction. I think it's great. I love this um, this uh, symbol matching um, uh, uh, battles that occur because one of my favorite games, especially this year, which is much heavier than this one, uh, much different game altogether, is Pol uh, Polis Fight for the uh, hegem Hegemony. I always have a hard time saying that. If you see the video, see I butchered it all the time. But uh, th that battle mechanism, again, is one where you flip a card and your opponent has to match a symbol but beyond that there's also a maneuver that might occur so there's a second layer within the battles and I like that because it's a bit of a press your luck it's a bit of a um, uh, trying to gauge what that other guy might have um, in his hand and then the, the thing that with Polis is only a two player game where here, if you're playing the multiplayer game, if you see people starting to battle, that might give you the opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, attack a wounded lamb while its, its leg is broken at the back of the pack there. So, uh, because the person after battle doesn't have a chance to rebuild their hand until the end of their next turn. So they're, they're quite weak at that um, point in time. So again, that for some people is a plus because then it gives you an opportunity to capitalize on other people's misfortune. And for other people, that might be a minus because if you're starting to get picked on, well, then you might be picked on multiple turns in a row get get ready for that so you might find that a little bit frustrating but then again it's a light game experience if that i if i was getting picked on like that playing polis after two and a half hours i would be really annoyed i'd probably flip the table i've never done that but that would be the reason why i would do it whereas here i find that the game is uh, quite a light experience and it's supposed to be just a light um, this is the type of game that I believe that you could kind of have a beer in one hand, a baby in the other hand, um, you know, the radio playing in the background, uh, uh, you know, your couple guys playing the game, you know, a bunch of people in the other room uh, watching the football or whatever, like a lot of chaos going on, yet you're not really distracted. You'll, you'll still hold your attention. You'll still be able to focus on the game because it's, it's just with fit that. It's not one of these big brain burners, intense brain burner type games. So I hope I've given you enough decision points about this game and enough information both for and against it as to whether or not it might be a game that's appropriate for you. My wife and I enjoyed some of our two player experiences and again it was because we found that this was a game we played, you know, 9.30 at night, the kids have finally gone to bed and uh, uh, it was the right weight for both of us at that time of night, especially after a long day at work or whatever. So that's enough for the video. I hope that you enjoyed it. That's all for now, and I hope to see you in the next video I do. Cheers.